Okay. So good evening, everybody. Um, I, it's my pleasure to welcome you to Argonne National Laboratory. And I uh, want to thank you for joining us tonight with uh, the next uh, lecture in the series of Out, Argonne Out Loud. And um, tonight we're going to hear from Argonne's um, Roger Bloomquist. He's going to talk about the past, present, and future of nuclear energy. This topic is the very center of, of Argonne in our history since we were it, it originally established as a nuclear engineering laboratory. It also has a real impact on what our future work will be at the laboratory. Today, nuclear energy is America's largest source of renew, or sustainable electricity. In fact, here in Illinois, six nuclear power plants produce about half of the state's electricity. And I'm not sure everyone really knows that the lights that are on in this building are due to nuclear energy um, in the state. The only source currently available that provides these large amounts of reliable, affordable electricity with no greenhouse gas emissions. So it is a green technology in the sense that it does not um, produce emissions. It will become increasingly important as we seek and to address climate change um, and for that reason. As you may or might not know, Illinois is the birthplace of nuclear energy. Um, the first man-made self-sustaining nuclear reaction actually happened in Chicago in 1942, about 70 years ago, come December 2nd, will be an anniversary. And that historic event took place under supervision of Enrico Fermi, which was, you might be surprised, although there is a, another laboratory in the region that is named after him, he was actually our first director. And since then, Argonne scientists and engineers, Roger among them, have been international leaders in the development of advanced re reactor technologies and provide safe, sustainable, and secure nuclear energy. Almost all operating commercial reactors in the world can trace their roots to the original designs that were developed here at Argonne National Laboratory. Today, we take a really kind of a cross-disciplinary approach to reactor design. We are re doing um, advanced reactor engineering, but we also do com computer simulation, uh, which is very important um, when developing new designs for nuclear energy. We also um, test the current proposed systems for safety. We do a lot of safety analysis here, and we looked at reliability and security. We also do a lot of research in finding new ways to, um, to look at non-proliferation. And what that means is that securing and safeguarding materials, nuclear materials worldwide, um, so that they don't get in the hands uh, for nefarious use. So, so it's really important that we understand that, but we do a lot of research in that area, and I think we've had a big impact. Um, inventing new materials, it comes from our roots here. The laboratory also has a very strong capability in material science. So we do a lot of work on materials that are used in reactor design to look at them in, in the terms of corrosion and irradiation types of damage. We also develop sensors, detectors, and diagnostics that are used in reactors um, to look at problems and systems um, be actually before they occur. So those are just m multidisciplinary kinds of areas that we work in for nuclear engineering here at the lab. So Roger Bloomquist. He's recognized as an extremely knowledgeable spokesperson in the promotion of nuclear energy and the work we've done at Argonne National Laboratory in advanced reactor technologies. After earning, earning his undergraduate degree in physics at the College of William & Mary, he became a nuclear engineer in the U.S. Navy. So not only can we thank him for his uh, long years of research for nuclear um, energy, but we can also thank him for serving our country. On active duty in the early 1970s, when he served on a nuclear submarine, he was responsible for the supervision of nuclear propulsion, plant operations, and radiological control. So early in his career, he was involved with nuclear energy. After active duty ended in 1974, he served for 20 years in the Navy Reserve, where he was responsible for the leadership and training of uh, reserve units. He retired in 2000 with the rank of captain. In 1979, Roger earned his PhD in nuclear engineering from Northwestern University. Since becoming, uh, coming to Argonne, he has devoted most of his efforts and research on reactor physics, including 600,000 or 60,000 lines of computer coding needed to solve the key questions of his field. He is, the, he is also the chair of the expert group on Monte Carlo source convergence and criticality safety analysis that sought uh, ways to improve the efficiency and computationally simulating re uh, reactor physics. 
So again, like I said, we do a lot of work in modeling and simulation, and Roger spent a good deal of his career in that area. Roger also did uh, nuclear design for Argonne's intense pulsed neutron source uh, booster target. The IPNS, as that's called, was an accelerator-driven neutron source for exploring the structure of materials through neutron scattering. It was kind of like the old technology version of what we now have here as the advanced photon source, which does even better X-ray types of diffraction and looking at, at uh, materials and, and other kinds of uh, um, products. So he's the author of a dozen of conference papers, journal articles, and Argonne uh, reports. He's chaired the International Technical Working Group on Computational Methods at the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. He's also chaired Mathematics and Computer, uh, Computational Division of the American Nuclear Society. He has also co-taught courses on nuclear engineering at, at uh, uh, Northwestern University and the University of Illinois Chicago. Before we welcome Roger, um, I have one request um, for you tonight. Is we, we know that this is a complex and sometimes contentious issue. Um, we hope that we'll be able to answer all your questions. Please hold your questions until Roger's done, but then we'll have a question and answer time, and there will be microphones in the audience to, to get your questions. We ask that you keep your questions as brief as possible so that we can make sure we get enough people, that everyone has a chance to, to ask their questions. If you have more questions afterwards, I'm sure Roger's willing to have you come up and, and engage with him after the, the talk. So, um, I guess that's about all I have as an introduction, so please um, give a warm welcome to Roger Bloomquist. Yeah. Good evening. About 1969, I was a young graduate student in physics at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, I intended to have a, a career in physics, which turned out to be the case, only it was reactor physics, not uh, high energy physics. And I read a book uh, entitled The Day We Almost Lost Detroit, which was about a, a reactor accident that occurred um, not too far from Detroit in which uh, some of the fuel in, in a reactor melted. And the book described in uh, excruciating detail how close uh, Detroit came to Armageddon. And uh, I concluded that uh, nuclear technology was probably not a good way to generate electricity because of the hazard. And I moved on to the rest of my physics studies. And then we had the first Vietnam era draft lottery in 1969. And my number was one out of 365. So um, some people viewed that as a tragedy. Uh, I thought it clarified the issue for me quite nicely. <coughs> and uh, I decided to uh, take advantage of an opportunity in the Navy where uh, they would uh, let me take advantage of my physics degree in, in my work instead of uh, maybe leading an infantry platoon in rice paddies. And so uh, I joined the nuclear Navy, and it was a terrific experience. And that is where I really learned the truth about this technology. And what I learned was that the book I had read, it was basically just a 100-page op-ed piece. So I lived with this technology. My bunk was 35 feet from the reactor. I supervised uh, reactor operations and radiological controls, so I had to know everything all of my subordinates did. So uh, all the way from uh, how the fissions were occurring and depositing heat in the fuel, all the way to where the waste heat was uh, emitted from the ship, because every power plant emits waste heat. So basically from soup to nuts and very deep. And oh, by the way, nuclear submarines have, they're very safe, but they don't have a lot of safety systems. The operators are the safety system. So we were trained uh, six ways to Sunday to respond to any kind of emergency. We didn't want to rely on uh, automated equipment. Anyway, but first a, a bit about uh, dealing with engineers, understanding engineers. We're sort of a special breed. And I, you know, you could put scientists in this group too, it depends. Um, but we. Uh, we don't mind working by ourselves, some of the time at least. Everybody needs a little social interaction. 
But I'm perfectly happy working in my office for six of my eight hours a day. And uh, you should know that the, the way you can tell if an engineer is an extrovert is when he talks to you, he's looking at your shoes, not his. <laughs> the other thing you need to know is engineers are always trying to make things better and optimized. So uh, you've all heard this uh, famous saying, you know, an optimist views a half-filled glass of water as half full, and a pessimist, pessimist sees it as half empty. What an engineer sees is quite different. The glass is too big by a factor of two. <laughs> we have our faults, however, and one of those faults is part of the work we do. We have to prove to ourselves that something we design is not going to fail, or if it fails, that it's really not a problem for anybody. <clears throat> and to do that, we uh, have a technique called the worst case analysis. So we dream up all these black swans. We design something that will work, and we say, well, okay, it breaks, this component breaks, what happens then, and so forth. And we propagate this through. We let everything break all the way through. So what's the worst that could happen? This kind of worst case analysis dogs engineers and especially nuclear technology. And I'll go into a bit more detail later. Uh, but first, uh, a word from our sponsor. Uh, Pam mentioned a lot of this. Argonne was founded out of the Manhattan Project, but we've only been a, a peaceful uh, nuclear energy lab. Um, the people who were on that team in 1942, many of them uh, were on the team that founded Argonne and did much of the seminal work at the beginning. And I've had the honor of meeting two of these people in this picture here, uh, Harold Agnew, who became the director of Los Alamos National Laboratory, and Bill Sturm, who worked in my division when I first came to the lab in 1979. Um, and that was a real honor for me. Uh, Argonne was established as the country's nuclear, civil nuclear energy laboratory. There are other labs which were assigned the missions of, of developing weapons and, and other aspects of science and technology, including nuclear science and technology. <clears throat> the, at the very beginning, the rate of exploration of this technology was just unbelievably rapid. At the beginning, Argonne developed the uh, water cool reactor uh, for the Navy and in partnership with Westinghouse. Argonne did essentially the work on the reactor core and Westinghouse focused more on the, uh, on the propulsion plant as a whole. And we built a prototype uh, reactor core and tested it, did all the physics work and turned it over to Westinghouse. And because the Navy was pouring a lot of money into this technology, it had the rapid development, and that is why today the pressurized water reactor is the primary, is the single largest uh, component of the nuclear electric uh, generating business. We also discovered in one of those experiments, uh, this was kind of a, a happenstance, there was a transient that we didn't fully understand. There was boiling going on in the water in this test reactor, and it behaved differently from uh, what was predicted, and it suggested that reactors in which water was boiling would still have a stable neutron chain reaction, and you always want a stable neutron chain reaction. And so we set up a bunch of experiments. We, I was still in short pants at this time. Our, our predecessors set up the, a set of experiments in Idaho uh, to prove this concept, and then we built here at Argonne the experimental breeder reactor number two, I'm saying, experimental boiling water reactor, excuse me, which was a follow-on to these uh, borax experiments in Idaho. The borax experiments were great fun. They did things like jerk out the control rods, and I've seen movies of water gushing out the top and all that. It was back when uh, engineers and scientists were cowboys. Uh, we don't do that anymore. We don't do any nuclear experiments here, even in Idaho. Uh, uh, things are done much more deliberately and slowly, uh, sometimes, if at all. We also developed uh, two other kinds of reactors, heavy water cooled reactors and graphite moderated reactors, which evolved into uh, some of the systems that were developed in other countries for nuclear power generation, primarily uh, Canada, the United Kingdom, 
and Russia. <clears throat> Perhaps our best innovation and the one that will be uh, have the longest, uh, the biggest long-term impact are breeder reactors or fast neutron reactors. The first one we built in 1951 and it produced electricity. It was the first reactor in the world ever to produce electricity. Um, what is a fast neutron reactor? When a neutron emerges from fission, it's moving at a very high speed and in a regular commercial reactor, it gets slowed down to where the physics are favorable for the chain reaction uh, with a minimum amount of uranium enrichment. In a fast reactor, we change the coolant. It's no longer water, it's something else much heavier, for example, sodium, and the neutrons don't slow down. That's kind of a physics detail, but it changes the kinds of reactions that occur in the reactor, and I'll go into a little bit more detail later why that is such a valuable idea. But EBR-1 was, was a very small system. We built a much bigger one, which is still not nearly a commercial scale, experimental breeder reactor number two. And this demonstrated a, the full uh, technology. So it included generating electricity, which we put on the grid in Idaho. Um, we did on-site nuclear fuel reprocessing, and we put some of it back in the reactor. And also we did a bunch of transient tests, which were fabulous tests in which we basically turned off all the safety systems and intentionally instituted an accident on that reactor because we knew that reactor would shut itself down and benignly uh, resolve the transient, which indeed it did. And so this was a major advance in reactor safety. And this is, uh, among all the reactor types, this type of reactor is best situated to survive those kinds of, of problems. Well, how did nuclear energy get such a bad rap? It, you know, as Pam mentioned, it's, it's got a lot of controversy surrounding it. There's a longstanding and unjustified association between civil nuclear energy and nuclear weapons. Um, to my knowledge, no country has developed nuclear weapons from an electricity generating reactor. It's much cheaper and easier, if you want to produce plutonium, to design your own plutonium production reactor and operate it. You operate it very differently than you would a power producing reactor. So there is a very tenuous connection at, at best between the weapons and the electricity generation side. Some of the technology is similar, but that's about the end of it. It'd be a bit like blaming uh, genocide on steel, for example, because they use machetes in Rwanda. Um, now we get back to uh, understanding engineers 101 again. Here are these worst case studies. So for example, the Nuclear Re Regulatory Commission uh, required, and it was reasonable at the time, that if there were some sort of a problem at a reactor, we had to assume that all the bad stuff got out. Well, we had this event called Three Mile Island, and it turned out a tiny fraction of the radioactive material got out, even, I'm talking about out of the reactor, not out of the building. It was pretty much trapped in the building. So, for example, that was an extremely uh, negative assumption we had to make in our safety analyses. This one is particularly interesting. This was a government-sponsored study, and the idea was to understand um, how best to handle the risks of shipping spent nuclear fuel. <clears throat> so that's a very complex subject. There are many, many parameters. You know, where is this uh, spent fuel if there's a terrorist attack on it? What's the nature of the terrorist attack, so forth and so on? So there were a bunch of simplifying assumptions that were, that were made. These are worst case assumptions, but the idea is we'll get sort of a bounding estimate of what the consequences of this might be. So <clears throat> the assumptions were that uh, this shipping cask, which is on the back of, the, of a truck, is uh, full of spent nuclear fuel, and it's stuck in rush hour traffic on an urban expressway in a high density neighborhood, you know, kind of like the outbound Ryan at 430. 
and uh, a bunch of terrorists who, who managed to get a hold of the Army's best anti-tank weapon uh, were perfectly positioned, and they were able to hit this thing, it's a cylinder, kind of like a Coca-Cola can, right on a diameter, and uh, it wasn't entirely sure that this missile would go all the way through, but we assumed it would go all, go all the way through. This was another lab, by the way. I use the term we very loosely here. We as engineers. <clears throat> And even though spent nuclear fuel doesn't burn, uh, it was assumed that all of this material was somehow magically ejected from this shipping cask. And so it, now it's all over the, the Dan Ryan, let's say. And uh, the wind's blowing in exactly the wrong direction towards the highest population density around. And furthermore, everybody who is in that vicinity stayed put exactly as they were. They didn't move for 365 days, 24 hours a day. They didn't go indoors. Uh, they must have ordered pizza, I don't know. If you do that and you assume some uh, ultra-conservative dose-health effect relationship, you can actually come up with 250,000 deaths in a scenario like that. But there isn't a single part of that scenario that bears any resemblance to reality. And the idea that every one of those assumptions could be true is just, it's impossible. So that's my pitch on worst case. So anytime you see something in the news that says worst case, put your hand on your wallet. <clears throat> then we've been the subject of a perfect storm of uh, uh, both news media and entertainment media uh, misrepres misrepresentations or inaccuracies. Um, I don't want to, I'm not saying that people in the news media uh, have an ax to grind or, any, or they're intentionally inaccurate. They have deadline pressures. This is a complex technology. Technology is hard to cover. But the upshot is that news, news sells and uh, some of the bad news is what gets the emphasis. We had these uh, movies, and these movies are uh, all perfectly innocent screenplay ideas. Every, every screenplay has to have a crisis and a danger and all that, so what's wrong with a radiation-induced mutant? But you know, if you see 15 of these movies when you're a kid, it starts to resonate in your mind. So uh, it's worth uh, keeping that in mind when, when you're seeing uh, uh, entertainment in the popular media. Uh, we also have some issues with semantics. So he who controls the semantics controls the discussion. So solar and wind is grown on farms. Isn't that nice and domestic? Look, the grass is green there. It's just a really nice place. Nuclear is produced in plants. So look at these big devices here. By the way, these are cooling towers. And what's coming out the top, it looks awful, but it's actually water vapor. And by the way, this is a coal plant, not a nuclear plant, but <laughs> <coughs> nuclear plants use these too. So when you see one of these, it's not necessarily a nuclear plant. And of course, nuclear waste goes into a dump. What else would it go into? And then we have our own uh, terminology. This is, this is pretty much our fault. <coughs> When a reactor is at, at steady state, 100% power, making money for the utility, we say the reactor is critical. That's from a mathematical term, the critical eigenvalue. And that makes, makes perfect sense to us, but if you're critical, this is, whoops, this is where you are, and you want your family, your priest, and your lawyer there. <clears throat> so that's a very unfortunate term. And then, of course, what's waste? Most people's concept of waste is stuff that's in a, in a dump or a, a trash can or something like that. And I'll, I'll describe what nuclear waste actually is in a minute. <clears throat> so my personal take on all this is there's this uh, political context and social context that surrounds the, uh, the public discussion of nuclear energy. And, uh, there are some dedicated opponents who take advantage of all these, uh, our own flaws and, and this terminology and, and people's fears. 
And they also keep up a drumbeat of lawsuits if there's something actually about to happen, such as licensing a, nuclear, a new nuclear power plant. And people perceive this connection with, with nuclear weapons <coughs> and so forth. And another problem we have in the, in the industry is, believe it or not, the nuclear industry is rather small when you compare it to the other energy industries. So in terms of a political footprint, they can't compete. What we hope to do for people and, and at other labs, other national labs too, is provide you with some, some uh, independent uh, opinions and information that you can trust on topics like these, as well as other parts of science. Well, why should we use nuclear? Well, it's affordable, it's sustainable, it doesn't pollute. Why is that? If I take a kilogram of uranium-235 and fission it, and a pound, I'm sorry, a pound of uranium and a pound of natural gas and burn it, the amount of energy I get out of the uranium is a million and a half times more than what I get out of the same mass of natural gas. <clears throat> well, that could be nice or ominous, but when you think of it as, think of it as coal, for example, that means a 1,000 megawatt nuclear plant runs for two years on the amount of fuel I can fit in a semi-truck trailer. A coal plant with the same size requires about two train loads of 100 cars each per day. So the amount of material is vast, and that means the material can't be contained inside the coal plant. It has to go through, otherwise it would pile up and clog the plant. So this means a nuclear plant can be a closed system and all fossil fuel plants, because of the volume of materials they have to burn and dispose of, has to be an open system. And open means polluting, it's inherent. And that's why reactors were put on submarines. They don't need any air, for example. So it's extremely clean, zero air pollution, zero CO2 emissions, zero solid waste. It's extremely clean. We had 105 guys on my ship. It was guys back then. Um, and the biggest problem was running out of food. There was no radio, radiological uh, issues inside that ship. It was essentially perfectly clean. Obviously, we didn't go hug the reactor while it was operating. That was in its own space with a shield, but it was completely radiologically benign. In fact, my dose at sea may have been lower than my dose on land because seawater forms a very nice cosmic ray shield. This is the output of a coal plant in Kingston, Tennessee. And this is the result of an accident. This stuff is coal fly ash. Now, ash sounds relatively benign, but this is full of, among other things, uh, mercury, uranium, selenium, all kinds of chemically toxic stuff. And there's too much of it to contain. And, of course, this is the minority of the mass. Most of the mass goes out the stack in the form of carbon dioxide. And while natural gas is, doesn't have this problem, it still has that problem. In fact, today in the United States, about two-thirds of the emissions-free energy is produced in nuclear uh, electric generation plants. And most of the rest is produced in hydro plants. <clears throat> One of its characteristics is nuclear is always on. In that slide, I showed you the picture of the atom. Um, there were, uh, I use the word stored. Stored is a key word because when energy is stored, it means you can use it when you need it. You don't have to use it when it falls into your lap, such as when the wind blows or when the sun shines. This is data from a wind farm in Germany. It's a 30, rated at 35 megawatts, which is how much power it would produce if the wind were blowing at exactly the right uh, speed for these turbines. 
This is the average over this one year. This each red bar is the electricity production for one day. So this is the average. So a 35 megawatt plant produces about eight megawatts on average. <clears throat> the question comes up, well, what about days like these when I need even just eight megawatts? Where's it gonna come from? And the answer is, if you build your entire electricity grid with plants like these, you then have to add a gas plant for each of these wind plants to produce electricity to fill in all this white space. In other words, wind farms are primarily gas burners in today's electricity market. So wind is nice, I don't oppose wind, but it is intermittent, and until we find an economical and convenient way to store the energy that's collected uh, by wind turbines, uh, we're gonna be faced with this problem. Some places don't have a difficulty with that. Switzerland, for example, has got loads of mountains and they can pump the water uphill behind a dam and then draw it out as hydropower later on. Um, Illinois is, uh, we're in an energy desert from that point of view, even though we've got lots of coal. So what about cost? Well, if I take the entire cost of generating electricity from constructing the plant all the way through decommissioning, including fuel and employees and all that stuff. <clears throat> I take that cost and, and uh, divide it by the total amount of power produced in the lifetime of that plant. These are the numbers I get. So you can see right around here, these are all roughly similar. Gas is quite a bit more expensive. This is 2011. If I did this again for this year, this would be considerably lower. But if I did it for six years ago, that would be up around here. So you've all seen your gas bills fluctuate on your home heating bill over the last 10 years. Uh, when you rely on gas, you are betting on the gas price. Anyway, uh, nuclear is competitive with everything. Hydro is the only thing cheaper. Uh, it's expensive to build, but very cheap to operate. So if you can take a strategic view over the life of the plant, nuclear is a very inexpensive source of power. <clears throat> so how do reactors work? I'm gonna get technical here, for those of you who came to hear something technical, briefly. Um, this is a cartoon of a neutron chain reaction. A chain reaction, my definition is, a reaction in which one of the products is also one of the inputs. So in combustion, it's the heat from the combustion that is an input to the combustion because the fuel has to be evaporated in order for it to burn. In this case, it's the neutrons that come out of the fission. So here's a uranium-235 nucleus that's absorbing a neutron. It splits, when it fissions, it splits into roughly two roughly equal chunks. <clears throat> and these go flying through the material just some tiny distance and deposit their energy as heat and then there are also two to three neutrons that come out which can go on to cause other fissions. And when the reactor is critical, on the average from generation to generation we have the same number of fissions. So that's why critical is sweet for us. We should have said sweet actually at the beginning. The reactor is sweet, but we didn't have media consultants then. <laughs> now there's something else about this. I, wa I want you to uh, imagine that this is not uranium-235. U-235 fissions very nicely. Suppose it's uranium-238, which actually most of uranium is in the world, and most of the uranium in a reactor is uranium-238. It absorbs a neutron, and only it doesn't fission much. 90% of the time it doesn't. It gets turned into plutonium-239, which actually acts a lot like uranium-235. It's a perfectly good reactor fuel. But sometimes plutonium-239 doesn't fission either when it absorbs a neutron. It becomes plutonium-240 and goes up through these series of neutron captures and becomes plutonium-242 or americium or curium or californium. If you remember your periodic table, these are the elements off to the right of uranium at the bottom. <clears throat> and those are the bad actors in nuclear waste or spent nuclear fuel. Well, what does nuclear waste look like? This is a, uh, an exploded diagram of a reactor fuel assembly. 
A reactor is, is a rack of a bunch of these. Uh, about several hundred of them arranged in a big cylindrical pattern. These are 12 feet tall, and they consist, each one of these is a rack of pins, and each pin is a hollow metal tube with a stack of uranium dioxide pellets in it. U o, uranium dioxide is a ceramic just like your bathroom floor tile. It's chemically pretty much inert. These uh, pins are welded shut, so it's sealed in there, and then these are placed in the rack and operated in the reactor. And after three to five years, uh, the uranium-235 is used up, and we take this out of the reactor. All that radioactive material is still sealed in that welded pin. So this is the initial nuclear waste that comes out of a reactor. And it's put in a spent fuel storage pool. It sits there for five or 10 years. And now these days, we're moving these to above ground storage where they're air-cooled, because the rate at which these generate heat goes down after a while, and it's much easier to handle. We need it in water initially, but uh, not after five years. Well, what's the industry been doing? Uh, in the early days, in the 70s, our plants operated about half the time. Now, the economists among you will see right away this is a bad idea because these are expensive to build and cheap to operate. So all of your cost is in building it. So uh, you're basically wasting your asset half the time if that's all you're operating. But what the operating companies have done is they've gotten a lot more efficient, effective, and safe. And now, instead of operating only half the time, they routinely operate on average across the entire fleet about 90% of the time. That's a huge improvement in power plant economics and the energy supply, too. In the United States today, uh, this is our power mix. This is electricity. Nuclear is 20% about. It's been that for the last 20 years or so. Even as power is growing, or power consumption is growing, because the capacity of these, uh, capacities of these plants have been increasing due to improved engineering and some new components and so forth. Right now, coal is shrinking and gas is expanding, by the way. Where are the plants in the United States? They're where the loads are, mostly, except California is uh, a little bit shy of, of nuclear. But a lot of them in the southeast, and then a lot, of, a lot along the eastern seaboard, and we've got a lot in Illinois, as Pam mentioned. Now, here is where the new reactors are being built. There are six reactors being uh, constructed in the United States right now, four new ones and two older ones that were suspended before, and now they've picked it up again. They can do that here because they have a different way of financing reactors than we do in Illinois. Exelon in, in Illinois has to plunk down its $5 billion a copy beforehand in order to build one of these. Uh, the utilities in the southeast can charge their customers a little bit in advance to help pay for them before they actually get switched on and start producing revenue. And that actually makes a big difference in the cost if interest rates are high. In the world, we're the winner. We produce way more nuclear electricity than anybody else, even the French. Now, the French produce 75% of theirs, so they don't have any other sources to speak of. Uh, obviously, Japan has cut way back. You'll see growth in South Korea and China, especially China, which is building almost 30 reactors today and there are, they have plans for another 50 or 60 over the next 10 or 15 years. So what are we doing about all this at Argonne? Well, these are our objectives. We want to make nuclear more economical. We do that, we want to do that by helping uh, with extending the licenses, the lifetimes of our current reactors, and we want to be able to help the designers of uh, new reactors uh, improve their designs. Um, this is not related to nuclear energy, nuclear electricity. We want to uh, foster uh, improved nonproliferation. And so we have a very big program in my division to reduce the enrichment in research reactors from highly enriched uranium, which is theoretically usable in a bomb, down to, to low enriched uranium. These are at universities and labs all over the world. So. That's, that's an important project. It has nothing to do with electricity generation. 
Um, we also want to extend the usable uranium and thorium resources. Our current generation of reactors uses uh, uranium very inefficiently. Uh, the best analogy I, I can think of is you throw a, a log into your fireplace and you burn it until the bark is gone and then you take it out and call it waste and store it. The rest of that wood could be burned. And in fast neutron reactors, we can use way more. We can use essentially all of the uranium. And oh, by the way, we can also use thorium. So that's, that's a long-term approach to a resource issue. And we like to, uh, we want to produce technical options to resolve what's called the waste problem. Um, or you could call it the waste opportunity if you want. And we want to, to develop designs that are inherently safe and that we can demonstrate are inherently safe. So for the current light water reactors, uh, this is what we're doing. We're, we're studying the materials, how the materials behave in a reactor during the time when it's uh, being bombarded with neutrons and producing power. Neutron bombardment changes materials, the way they, they behave, their strength, and all those kinds of properties. And we want to be uh, sure we thoroughly understand that. And we have some uh, very nice laboratories here where we take some of the structural materials out of that have been in a reactor for a long time. And we put them in a hot cell because they're somewhat radioactive. And then we pull on them to see at what point they break, for example, or how they fail. So we want to understand the basic material science of the way these materials behave. And this will be useful in, in new reactors as well. <clears throat> now I want to describe for you how we handle science computation. How do we actually do our work? Let's take, for example, this situation. We're interested in, it's, it's important to know when the coolant comes out of the top of the reactor, how much it mixes with the coolant from the fuel assembly next to it. Because some of them are hotter than others. And you have thermal stresses in the components above and so forth. It's just important to know that. And we want to be able to compute that. And we have very sophisticated computer programs that can do that. But this is a reactor. We want to be sure we're right. So. Uh, we set up some experiments. This is an example. You can't see it here, but underneath are a couple of those fuel assemblies, kind of like I showed you in one of those early slides. And we're pumping, we're blowing air up through there with particles suspended in the air. And there's a laser here with a big digital camera that can follow these particles as they whip around because of the air motion. Any of you who, who have uh, dusted a shelf in the sunshine will know what I'm talking about. You can see the fluid flow field. And we solve the same problem with our computer program. And these are the results. And we compare the results to the experiment. And when they agree over a wide range of conditions, then we know that our computer simulations are accurate. They work. They represent truth. And they can be relied upon. Here's another example. This is a, a material science issue. Now, this has blown up quite a bit. This is a, a, a fuel element taken out of a research reactor. This is the cladding, which is the material that, that seals all the radioactive stuff inside. And then these are fuel particles. All these little bits in here are fuel particles. And this one has been in a reactor for several years and been irradiated. And uh, we want to know, how is this behaving? So we, we take this out of the test reactor. We cut it open, and then we magnify it maybe 250 times, put it under a microscope. Um, this sort of dark gray, that's the fuel chunks in there. So you could, this is a, a fuel in which it's not uniform. We don't want it to be uniform. This is the fuel, and this is the aluminum that it's sitting in. And this is something unpleasant here, which is a, a mixture of the two or the products that has a, a has undergone a chemical reaction, and it allows porosities to form in here. And fission gases, some of the fission products that I showed you in that fission cartoon, are gases. And they collect in here, and because they're a gas, they swell. They, they squeeze the fuel out, and it distends the fuel. And that's bad. 
This was an early fuel that we tried this with, and when we looked at this, it was pretty clear this fuel would never work. And the solution was to mix some silicon in with the aluminum. And when we did that, these voids did not appear anymore. So this is, the analogy here is, you're having your boss's, boss and his wife over for dinner, and you are uh, fix, you wanna fix uh, Beef Wellington, but you've never made it before. So the week before, you invite your least favorite brother-in-law over and fix him the Beef Wellington, just so you know that it's gonna work. <clears throat> so once we've done this, we know that a fuel is gonna survive the conditions in a reactor, and then we can safely uh, fuel an entire reactor with it instead of just one test plate. So it's a very deliberate process where we're constantly checking uh, our results for unpleasant surprises. Now, I'm running over just a quick bit on nuclear waste. This is the mass. If I just take a block of uh, this much uranium at the end, I have fission products some plutonium and some of those other elements I mentioned, californium, curium, and so forth, and only a little bit of uranium-235 left. All of this, plus this, plus the plutonium, plus these are fissionable. They are an energy resource, and we should be using that. Considering the uh, radiotoxicity issue, this is, okay, so nuclear waste is toxic. This is a plot of how toxic it is. This is a log-log plot. So this is 10 years after we take the fuel out, 100, 1,000, 10,000, and so forth. And this is how toxic the ore is in the ground before we dig it up. So this stuff is all over the place. We don't try to dig it up and sequester it now. So if we can make this stuff less radioactive than that, we've met our obligations to society and future generations. Fission products. This is the fission product curved. It goes, this is the radiotoxicity after 10 years, so it's 1,000 times more radioactive than what we put in. And after 300 years, it's less radioactive than what we dug out of the ground. This is the bad stuff, the plutonium, the curium, and all that stuff. This can fission. We can put this back into a reactor, a fast neutron reactor, fission it, and that material then splits into fission products, which end up basically on this curve. And this is what we believe is going to be the solution for the nuclear waste problem. It's actually a nuclear energy opportunity. We'll convert the long half-life stuff to short half-life and we'll generate electricity in the process. Let me just skip over that. <coughs> um, I'd encourage all of you to uh, engage the laboratory in these ways so you can arrange tours for groups. You can ask for speakers for your civic groups and church groups and so forth. And you can ask us questions by emailing that address. And when we're done, I'll put this back up so you have time to copy it. <clears throat> and now I would be happy to take questions. What is the plausibility of a fusion reactor? A fusion reactor? <clears throat> there are fusion reactors, but they don't break even. They, in other words, they consume more energy than they produce. And uh, there, no doubt, someday will be fusion reactors, but there are terrific engineering challenges to solve to get there. So it's past the laboratory stage, but it's not really at an energy production prototype stage yet. Uh, since I've been working in fission technology, the saying has always been fusion is 30 years away. It was when I started, and that was 30 some years ago, and th it's the same story today. It doesn't mean that that time won't shorten someday, but uh, there are uh, very large challenges. When you talk about the difference between fast and slow reactors, this, my assumption is that mostly slow reactors are in use today, is that correct? With just a handful of exceptions, all the commercial reactors in the world are slow neutron or thermal okay. reactors. So adjusted for inflation, the cost of generating or producing those 
reactors versus the fast neutron reactors? What, how did that cost compare? Um, I can't answer that question because that's really a subject of, of, of what we do and we haven't identified adequately the cost of fast reactors. We could tell you how much EBR2 costs, but that was a small prototype reactor that was built out in the middle of nowhere uh, 40 years ago. So uh, identifying the cost and finding ways to make sure the cost isn't excessive is one of our, that's one of our key objectives. So we don't know. Our son is basically a new arc, uh, uh, reactor. Am I correct in saying that? Every star is a nuclear reactor in effect? Uh, the question is, uh, are stars nuclear reactors? Yeah, they're fusion reactors, actually. OK, now what happens to the waste material that develops well, stars are very dense, and so they have, uh, they have a huge gravitational field, and so that waste is just contained in them. And uh, I don't know what happens when they finally explode in a supernova. I'm not an astrophysicist. All, we don't know. Yeah, we do have astrophysicists at Argonne, but I am certainly not one of them. Basically, the waste is, is uh, still contained within the... Uh, yeah. The and, and oh, by the way... that. That was one of the concepts that was thought of, well, what do we do with nuclear waste? Maybe we should shoot it into the sun. It'll get consumed and turned into sunlight. Um, sorry, uh, sort of a lighter question. What does a nuclear reactor look like on a submarine? Um, I've always wondered. Um, hmm. It looks like what it looks like. Is <laughs> I mean, how the, big the is it? The flip answer, it's, um, it's, it's Sort of the size of a VW Bug, maybe a little smaller. Does that, does that help? And it's got a, a big reactor vessel, and then it's got this big steam generator heat exchanger off to the side. And the pipes are kind of about like that, whereas for a commercial power plant, the pipes are big honking pipes. You mentioned that the fast reactors can use nuclear waste for, for fuel. Um, down the road, I wondered how many years we are away from actually doing that. We have all this nuclear waste we've accumulated all these years. It sounds like it would be a great... Technologically, we are there now, uh, except we haven't really nailed down the, the, uh, the cost. Um, politically, we are not there. there. We have to reprocess the nuclear fuel. Reprocessing has, comes with another set of political baggage. and. Uh, it's technologically challenging, but we, we, we did it with at EBR2, so we know it can be done on something like an industrial scale. We just don't know how much it would cost, for example. Do you, uh, with regard to some of the new reactor designs that are described on some of the back uh, posters, uh, what kind of time frame do you view or do you see as some, uh, for having some of these new designs come online? There are a couple of generations of or reactor concepts that are being mooted right now. One of them is our small modular reactors, and we've done some work on those. Uh, those are interesting because they don't cost as much per reactor, even though they may cost more per megawatt hour, but it's a, it's a smaller bet for a company to place. Also, there's a, uh, there's a possibility of reduced cost because you can manufacture them in factories where putting something together is cheaper than out in a field somewhere. Uh, the Department of Energy has a program of funding companies to uh, get these reactors through the licensing process. Uh, why is that necessary? Well, it costs something like between 200 and 400 million dollars in fees and engineering expenses to license a reactor with the NRC today. So, and that's with no guarantee you're actually going to emerge from the other side. So you can understand the reluctance of, of private companies to bet that kind of money on a concept. If they could just build it, then they could rely on their own engineers. But the NRC, uh, I'm not criticizing the NRC, they're, they're a very competent uh, technical organization and they serve the public very well. But the effect of this licensing process is uh, an inhibition to innovation. And so that's why the department has this program to, uh, to kind of get through that barrier. I had uh, 
two questions, but I'm going to change my two questions. The first one is, you mentioned earlier, from the history and the words that we use, uh, like critical and those kinds of things, what can we do from now on to change the perception of uh, reactors? And then the second half of the question would be, I saw on some of the posters this word inherently safe or intrinsically safe. Uh, what would be an intrinsically safe reactor? Okay. Uh, what can we do? First question is, we can operate the reactors we have safely. We can build the ones we're building well and operate them well. And people will understand that reactors are safe and that all these words are sort of labels that don't really matter very much. And in fact, people should realize there hasn't been one single death in the United States from the operation of any commercial nuclear power plant. Depending on whose estimates you want to count, uh, it's either 10,000 according to the National Academy of Sciences or 24,000 according to the American Lung Association, deaths associated from the burning, per year, deaths associated from burning coal. When I say there hasn't been a single death, I don't mean per year, I mean ever in the United States from commercial nuclear energy generation. <clears throat> um, what was the second question? Oh, inherent safety. What we want is for reactors to be completely safe, and no matter what happens, if the operators do nothing, they have, let's say, a week to figure out what the problem is and fix it. So, for example, at Fukushima, everything was fine until the tsunami hit and destroyed the diesel generating, the backup electrical power, and that was when they had to figure it out right away, and they didn't have time. So, for example, EBR2, uh, we could uh, turn off all the safety systems, turn off the main coolant pumps. This is with the reactor at 100% power, and it would essentially shut itself down, and it would sit there and percolate, and no action would be required by anybody to remove the heat for at least a week. So that's what we call inherent safety. It's built in through feedbacks, uh, sort of like in your car, and you step on the gas to speed up a little bit. Eventually, the friction from the wind and the road uh, takes away the additional acceleration and you steady out at a higher speed, that's a feedback. So we want to, we design reactors that way so that the feedbacks take care of it. Not safety systems, not circuits, not pumps, not valves, nothing has to move. It's just what happens to the materials that quenches the chain reaction and removes the heat naturally. We use, a, there are a lot of terms we could apply, naturally safe, inherently safe, passively safe, each one of them comes with some uh, inferences that maybe aren't perfectly appropriate, but that's the basic idea. So uh, in the, one of the previous slides, you were showing uh, some work you were doing in studying like the porosity of various materials that had been in, you know, materials that had been in nuclear reactors, and you were working on ways of, you know, maybe in, you know, silicon infusion with the materials to reduce the porosity, which I assume the result of that work will be used in building future reactors. Yeah. Right. Um, I mean, with that being said, my understanding is there's a, a large number of reactors in the United States, probably the majority are extremely old, you know, like 30 years old, maybe even, maybe even more. So, and maybe some of this is media driven, you know, probably a lot of it is media driven, but there is concerns about what will happen to those reactors that are currently running, the ones that, you know, they got their licenses in like the 80s, 70s, you know, 1960s are still running, you know, how we, some people are asking questions, is it, how long can we safely operate those particular reactors? How are we going to address those operations, those old reactors are currently operating in the U.S.? Okay, well, I'm not an expert on that, but I can tell you that um, fuel only stays in a reactor for, between four and five years, typically, a commercial, one of today's commercial reactors, and then it's taken out. So that is not an age issue. The age issue comes up with the structural components in the reactor vessel, which is where the neutron irradiation occurs. And what, what's been done is we've, we, here I am again using the uh, proverbial we, the industry has put metal samples in there to get irradiated during regular operation and then when they refuel after a while, they take them out, and then they study how the irradiation is affecting the material. So this is being done on an experimental basis um, even now. So it's a way of confirming the material properties. 
Uh, I would like, on behalf of all of us, I'd like to thank you for your Navy experience. You uh, saved us for 20 or 30 or 40 years from, from war, so thank you for your expertise. Um, but it seems that the nuclear energy industry is uh, in for a game-changing, transformational new direction compared to all the understandings that we've previously had. The two things come to mind what is right now on Mars, uh, there's a thermoelectric generator driving a dune buggy. Uh, seems very simple, seems like it could be scaled up so hundreds of thousands of those things could be made and scattered all over with a, a no moving part strategy towards the use of nuclear energy. And another thing that the news has convinced a lot of people against nuclear energy was Fukushima, and it was the hydrogen generation that caused a, a lot of um, engineering problems, it seemed, as well. Um, and there has been work on actually generating hydrogen, uh, doing a thermal split of water. So could not an extremely small, simple, um, no moving part like device be made to generate hydrogen rather than the steam and the electricity and the motors and the generators that make a big plant. Some of the reactor uh, research and developments going on today uh, here in, in Idaho uh, involves uh, reactors, very high temperature reactors where the heat can be used to produce hydrogen from water. So uh, that's a way of, that's another way of storing the energy in some other way and maybe producing a liquid fuel that might replace gasoline, for example. So there, there, are, there are lots of opportunities for that. So um, did I fully answer your question? Close. Okay. Okay. Uh, you, you had on your graph up there that Germany's got you know, nuclear power now. Is there a movement in, in uh, Germany to uh, shut those down? They're not going to make any more or dismantle them and go all to... Uh, uh, solar and uh, wind, and is that a movement in Europe that's going with this kind of stuff? Or could that spread here? It's because somewhat, of J because of the Japan problem. I, I it's think. somewhat pervasive in, in Europe, but it's especially concentrated in Germany. They've made a political decision to phase out nuclear, and uh, part of that decision, their intention is to replace it with wind and solar, but what that sentence should really say is wind, solar, uh, Russian gas, uh, and coal electricity from Poland. So uh, they're going to have a very difficult time replacing their nuclear generating capacity with wind and solar. And in fact, just this week I read that the Czech government has uh, decided they're going to block surplus German electricity from their solar and wind plants because it disrupts and disturbs the Czech electricity grid and the Germans have to get rid of it somehow. So there are lots of uh, uh, systema systemic complications that are going to arise that they will have to deal with. Other countries have, have abandoned nuclear and then changed their minds. Sweden is, is, is one example for that. And I suspect uh, what you hear from Japan now, um, they are, uh, it's understandably shy of restarting their reactors, but they have a, a very strong uh, economic imperative. They, they are going to be forced to answer the question, how many people are we willing to have unemployed uh, as a consequence of not restarting enough of their reactors. So they have a challenge. Europe is a small place, and uh, you will know, as I do, that almost all of the French power reactors are on the borders of France, and therefore very close to neighboring countries like Germany. So if the Germans close down all the reactors, it won't change the hazard. They do, and, and they actually, the French actually export electricity to the U United Kingdom under the English Channel from their reactors, so it's a, it's a good business for them. We have a, a question back here. This comes from uh, social media. This is from uh, Daniel Yunt in uh, Muskego, Oklahoma. This is more of a statement, but he wants you to uh, comment on it. He says, I don't believe nuclear can meet our energy needs. If you were to build one plant every day forever, it would not catch up to what the globe would need. We need another answer. Nuclear can only offset at best, but it can't get rid of the oil and coal energy economy. Um, okay, I would say a couple things in answer to that. One is, I never said it's the answer to all of our energy issues, our energy needs. The other is, you cannot build a gigawatt solar plant every day either. They're very expensive. They take a lot of materials. In fact, they take more energy, more materials than a, a, a nuclear power plant does per 
per megawatt of capacity, for example. But I, I, I think nuclear has an obvious future long-term role and an expanded one, uh, especially if uh, your concern is climate change, CO2 emissions, and uh, issues like that. And we did build, we did build 100 reactors in this country in about 15 years, in the 70s and early 80s. So um, the idea that we can't build reactors very fast has uh, been demonstrated to be not correct. My question is about uh, Yucca Mountain. Uh, what are the prospects for storing spent fuel air? And if that's done, is it going to be possible to recover for reprocessing at some time in the future? Absolutely. Um, we can store spent fuel uh, indefinitely and decide to reprocess it later on. And in fact, that was the idea with Yucca Mountain. It was going to be a retrievable facility for 100 years. And so if we changed our minds and decided to reprocess, we could take the fuel out and ship it to the reprocessing plants and proceed as if we had never put it in Yucca Mountain. After 100 years, it was going to be closed, and then it's engineered so it would be uh, unavailable after that. But there's no reason, actually, we can store spent fuel above ground, as we're doing now at the site, safely for a very long time. That fuel has been in a very hostile environment in the reactor for years and already survived that. It's a very benign environment in one of these big uh, concrete monoliths above ground where it's air cooled. There's no corrosive uh, water or anything uh, that would lead to long-term damage of the fuel. So um, I think that's what we'll end up doing, actually, when we finally get our act together and, and start reprocessing we will have uh, this vast resource of spent fuel available. And there are other vast uranium resources we have, too, that don't require mining, so. I think I recall that there are no current uh, nuclear plants uh, lately, and are there any plans for any being built? We are currently building, we, there it is again. Uh, the United States is building two plants and two reactors in Georgia. Two reactors in South Carolina. These are brand new. These are the latest designs. These are, uh, if they're not inherently safe, they're pretty close to inherently safe. So these are, are very advanced. Uh, they just started those. The NRC just granted those licenses uh, uh, some months ago. And then uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority is, is resurrecting these two construction projects that they began and then suspended uh, a couple of decades ago, and those will, those will very probably be finished. So we've got six that are being added. Uh, on the other hand, we've got several reactors that have serious um, uh, repairs that need to, have, need to be made, and those companies are going to evaluate whether it's economical to spend all that money on the repairs or just shut them down. So we'll probably see, my guess is, one or two or maybe three reactors basically go by the wayside uh, permanently about the time when these other reactors come online. Okay, I think we're going to stop formal questions, but certainly after this uh, <coughs> session, I think Roger would be willing to discuss further questions with everybody. Um, so I'd just really like to thank you all for coming, and, and thanks for the really great questions. Um, I think it's very thought provoking. So before I let you go, I want to let you know that we'll have the next Argonne Out Loud um, on March 14th, and we'll, that'll be a celebration of Pi Day. And uh, the speaker will be Pete Beckman, who is known for the, his, uh, in the world for his expertise in high-performance computing. And um, he's the director of Argonne's Exascale Technology and Computing Institute. And that will be actually held in a different building. It'll be held in our uh, computer um, uh, theory and computing sciences building, which is right at the front gate. So hopefully tell your friends, and I hope you'll all come back for that um, next session. Thank you. <laughs>